Hi everyone, this is Scott Johnson of the Illinois High School Association with a special presentation from the IHSA archives. March Madness is synonymous with basketball here in Illinois. And if you're a history buff, you know that it was the IHSA's own H.V. Porter who popularized the phrase with a poem he wrote in 1942. But H.V. Porter was much more than a poet. He was a teacher, a musician, a principal, and an outstanding basketball coach. His team at Tiny Athens High School finished second in the state in 1924, quite an accomplishment in itself, but his career really took off after he joined the IHSA a few years later. In those days, basketballs had laces, just like footballs. And while he was with the IHSA, Porter oversaw the development of a new type of basketball, the molded basketball, which held its air, stayed round, and bounced uniformly. Of course, the molded basketball changed the game of basketball forever. And H.V. Porter was basketball's foremost rules expert, serving as secretary of the National Rules Committee for almost three decades, writing the rules that were followed by literally millions of players and coaches across North America. It was for these things, and not because of March Madness, that he was inducted into the National Basketball Hall of Fame in its second class in 1960. But on top of all of this, Porter left behind one more gift, waiting to be discovered in the attic of his summer cottage in northern Wisconsin. Twenty reels of film, just like this, documenting some of the early events of the Illinois High School Association's history, and in particular, the basketball tournament. These reels cover the tournaments from 1932 to 1936. What you're about to see are the oldest moving pictures of the Illinois High School Association's basketball tournament, shot by H.V. Porter himself. Huff Jim wasn't even known as Huff Jim yet. It was still known as the New Jim. So let's start with the oldest film we have, the 1932 championship game between Canton and Morton of Cicero. Porter meticulously edited in title cards that help us identify the teams and the players in each game. And here comes Canton onto the floor. Canton is in the dark uniforms, Morton in the light. We've slowed down the action slightly to make it easier to see what's happening. There are no numbers on the jerseys in 1932, and no center line either. In 1932, a team could use the entire court to run its offense. This is action from early in the game. In general, both teams ran a slow, patient style of play. One of the things you'll notice is the unusual shape of the free throw lane, which was only six feet wide. Ever wonder why we say the top of the key? Well, it's because the lane resembled a keyhole. In reading accounts of games from the 30s, I've found frequent mentions of players taking and making shots from near half court, and I've often wondered if the sports reporters of the day were just exaggerating. We're about to find out. Canton was especially known for its deliberate offense, and on this play there is little effort to move the ball closer to the basket. And then suddenly... Yeah, that went in. And a little later, another long goal for Canton from the other side of the court. We can't see the shooter, but we see the result. And then there's this amazing sequence, some of which takes place outside the frame. According to Porter's count, Morton passes the ball 32 times before Bill Kokish finally takes a shot. While we're waiting, I can tell you that with almost 6,000 students, Morton was by far the largest school in the tournament, with eight times as many students as Canton. And since the IHSA office was in Chicago and Porter lived in the western suburb of Park Forest, Morton may well have been his favorite. Morton dominated play in the fourth quarter, and this play was the frosting on the cake. Now let's get back to the action. Off camera. Over to the right side. There's pass number 31, 32, and it's in. Let's see that shot again in slow motion. It looks like it's coming from almost 40 feet out. And with a successful goal, the teams return to center court for a jump ball. And here are the 1932 champions, coach Norm Zabel, with Erwin Kopecky, who scored eight in the title game, and Erwin Errol, who led all scores with nine, and Jim Vopica, who later coached Morton back into the Sweet 16 in 1961. Porter liked to have fun with his films, and at this point he inserted a clip of a ticker tape parade for the Chicago Cubs, who won the National League pennant in 1932.
Porter shot this footage from the window of the IHSA office, which was located on LaSalle Street. The next year, 1933, Porter caught the start of the first quarterfinal game, and there are plenty of empty seats at the end of the court on a Depression-era Thursday afternoon. The picture is much brighter, though, as the sun shines through the windows. And here's a look at the fashionable crowd for this contest, which was between Springfield and Hudsonville. On Friday, there were no games until the evening, and some of the principals on the Board of Control took a short walk over to the brand new University of Illinois Ice Arena to practice their figures. H.V. Porter even gave up the camera long enough to show his own moves on the ice. And then it was back to the hotel for a demonstration from the unnamed inventor of the electric basketball indicator. I wonder why it never caught on. The championship the next night came down to a battle between Thornton of Harvey and Springfield High School, whose coach, legendary Mark Peterman, had already won a state championship while coaching at Canton in 1928. Thornton was led by this young sophomore, Lou Boudreau, who would go on to become a legend in baseball, along with Miles Klein and Ted Slowinski, Darwin Hutchins in the background here, and, coming up, Tom Nisbet, who went on to coach his alma mater into the Sweet 16 three times. Back at Huff Gym, ready for action, and as Thornton comes together at center court, Watch for another Porter directorial trademark, the huddle shot. That's coach Jack Leip giving instructions. Here's some early action and a missed shot. And as play returns to the other end and Springfield scores, you'll see very clearly how play stops after a successful goal and the teams walk back to center court for another jump ball. That tended to slow the game down. A little later, Thornton gets the ball to Boudreaux on the left side for a long push shot. In this very low-scoring game, he made only one basket. Free throws were shot underhanded without exception. Here Tom Nisbet scores two to keep Thornton close. And the halftime score is Springfield 6, Thornton 4. Time for some circus entertainment. Late in the game now, Chuck Frazee of Springfield scores to bring Springfield within one at 14 to 13. Now with just seconds left, Springfield's Leroy Hallberg tries a desperation shot and misses. The buzzer sounds, and Thornton wins its first state championship. Then as now, the fans storm the court. Moving on now to 1934, the very first year of the Sweet 16, and some semifinal action between Thornton and Tiny Equality, and it's good to see that some things haven't changed over the last 80 years. Hey, old-timers, if you've been telling people that Pete Maravich invented the no-look pass, check out this feed from Lou Boudreau to Ken Hellman. And watch the athleticism on this play as Darwin Hutchins misses with his right hand, grabs the rebound, and scores with his left. The rubber band legs of Thornton's single male cheerleader got rave reviews from the tournament press corps. And on to the 1934 title game where Thornton was a prohibitive favorite over Quincy. Here's the opening tip, Thornton in the dark jerseys, Quincy in the light. Sports writers nicknamed Thornton the Flying Clouds because of the refreshing, faster paced offense. In the early going of this game, Thornton controls the ball, getting off a couple of misfires before finally scoring on a long bank shot by Gordon McComb from the left side of the court. But Quincy stays with the defending champions and takes a 16 to 15 lead at halftime. Quincy begins to pull away in the fourth quarter and Thornton has to resort to a long underhanded shot. Thornton keeps throwing shots up but none of them go in as the clock runs under a minute. Near the end of the game Perry Barcliffe scores on a rebounded free throw to put the game out of reach. Quincy wins its first state title in a 38 to 27 upset and once again the floor of Huff Gym is pandemonium. Well, I could probably go on forever, but we've run out of championship game highlights. Let's give three cheers for Old Huff Jim and for H.V. Porter, who shot this incredible footage. If you'd like to see more old basketball video covering 16 games in the five tournaments from 1932 to 1936, 
about 80 minutes in all, you can watch it here on the IHSA Archives channel on YouTube. If you happen to know anybody who actually attended any of these games, we'd love for you to show them the videos and let us know what their reaction was. I hope you enjoyed this introduction to the H.V. Porter films. I'm Scott Johnson for the IHSA Archives.